Thousands of great people like Bertrand Russell, Woody Allen, Stephen Hawking, Clean D. Student, so many others have already talked about why they do not believe in Christianity. Now I say I do not believe, so I have to explain to you what are the reasons. Well, you know, I have was born in a, an ordinary family and I was brought up in the Catholic traditions, in the rituals, beliefs, and I was taught that Jesus Christ came to redeem us and redeemed us from our sins and now we are eligible to reach heaven. I was sent to the seminary later where I studied philosophy, theology and religions. I also had the opportunity there to read books about Jesus written by philosophers, atheists, theists, Jews and scholastic or Catholic philosophers. After reading all these, I felt that most of them had the opinion that Jesus was fashioned after the then mythical gods like Horus, Osiris, Dionysus, Mitra and many others. They felt the real person as described in the gospel never lived. It could be that Joshua, a person by name Joshua, lived and he was an ordinary Jewish rabbi who was a writer's guy who went about speaking for Yahweh, asking people to mend their ways and go after the God. And he ridiculed the hypocrisy of Jewish scribes and uh, the Pharisees who conspired to kill him. And they forced Pantheus Pilate to crucify the poor Joshua. When he was crucified, you know, a lot of stories started coming in like the other mythical gods that he ascended to heaven. It was all very simple for these, I mean, evangelists to put in that story. We will see it now. Because most of these four Gospels were accepted by the Catholic Church in synods of fourth century. There were a number of Gospels at that time, a number of books written about this Joshua, I mean, Yeshua, Describing that he was married, he had children, he was an ordinary person, this, that. Gospel of Bartholomew, Gospel of Thomas, so many Gospels were available. But the Synods only selected these four which actually suited their purpose. They pictured him as God, they did miracles and this, that and they burned the rest. So in these four Gospels, that is only, let's say, books which tell about him. There is no historical evidence. There is no archaeological evidence, no evidence at all. And historians generally do not agree that a person by name, I mean Jesus, as described in the Gospels, ever lived. Anyway, if we accept that a person or a God-man lived and he came to redeem, redeem us humans, what was the sin from which he wanted to redeem us? The original sin, the eating of an apple or a fruit, forbidden fruit by God, that could have been easily forgotten by that loving God. But he did not do that. He burst into anger. He gave the first parents all trouble. He brought in death, suffering. He roasted their souls in hell. Still he was not mitigated. So he, you know, he made the entire descendants get birth in sin because of that small disobedience. But Again, he makes a grandiose plan to redeem humankind from that, you know, simple disobedience by sending his son and then he has to suffer and die an ignominious death. I mean, what more a foolish story can we ever hear about in the world? This is foolish. But anyway, accepting that theory because this is given in the, in the whole books of Bible, we shall go one by one. As we said, this guy had been passioned after the mythical gods. So mythical gods, this Osiris, Horus, Dionysus and Mitra, they were all born of immaculate birth. They were born, they ascended to heaven, they did a lot of miracles, they resurrected. And they did, I mean, uh, redeem people out of their sins. So these evangelists were careful to see that all these things happen in the life of Jesus too. So they bring in 
The story of Mary, a simple lady to whom an angel appears. The story goes like that. The angel appears to her and says that you will be pregnant with God and you will give birth to a baby. And naturally that baby becomes of immaculate birth. This child is to be born in, you know, in Bethlehem because most of the Jewish belief at that time was about a great redeemer. You know, Jewish people were under the, I mean, let's say, subjugation of Rome and Babylonian. They were in captivity. So they were going away from Yahweh, the tribal God. So the prophets of Yahweh prophesied, so they wanted to keep up the faith. So they prophesied about a mighty king who would come to redeem them. So this prophecy is about a mighty king, you know, had to be fulfilled in this poor, simple Yeshua. So we see that he was given birth in Bethlehem. For that, you know, Mary, who was fully pregnant, and Joseph had to travel two provinces to take part in a Roman census in which the woman had not to go. But she went because the child had to be born in Bethlehem, the town of or the city of David. There, you know, in a manger only he gets birth and the shepherds and kings and all come there and they recognize him like these mythical gods. And they sing praises to God. But nowhere else do we see that in, in his whole childhood, nobody recognizes him as a god. And he grows up like an ordinary child, you know, as an apprentice to his father, Joseph Carpenter. Only until his public life begins. Then as a child, again, he had orders all the children below two to be massacred because, I mean, I mean, there is a story like in Krishna where Kamsa orders the massacre of children, they draw a parallel with Lord Krishna. And Krishna's father took to flight and here Joseph and Mary takes to flight. These are all stories made to resemble another Lord. And when he was again a little more than a child, he was missing when his parents took him to a temple and the parents were searching for him frantically and they found him, I mean, let's say, having a discourse with the, I mean, priest, Leonard priest, like Buddha did. Again, Buddha, another, I mean, great person. So they wanted to draw a parallel with Buddha. You know, there are more than 120 parallels with Lord Krishna in the whole entire narration of the four Gospels. And when he went to a marriage party at 12, he converted water into wine as per the kiss of his mother, like Lord Dionysus had done. So his miracles begin. And then he starts his public life at 30, and then a line of miracles. I mean, who were to question these evangelists? They can write anything. All the four Gospels were written far away from the plain scene of action. You know, Nazareth or Jerusalem, they were not, I mean, uh, the, the places where Gospels were written. Gospels were written. One Mark did write his Gospel in 70 AD in Rome. Let's say Luke and John wrote their Gospels in uh, Asia Minor or Ephesus in about, I mean, 90 to 120 AD. And Matthew wrote his Gospel in Antioch in about 80 to 85 AD. These are all faraway places. And they were all wrote in Greek, which had nothing to do with the language this poor Yeshua and these ignorant disciples knew Aramaic. So they were written faraway places in Greek, a language they did not know, not by disciples, but by somebody, unknown authors, who wanted to project him as God. So whatever is written there, we do not know even one word or one deed as did by, or as done by Yeshua. They wrote on their own, whatever that come, came to their mind, drawing parallels from other gods. Now, we see after his death, again they bring in a story of, I mean, a re resurrection, where it's very easy. You know, some women disciples, when they stormed to anoint the body, they find that the body was not there. And then they bring in a story that uh, there was apparition of Yeshua to some of the disciples, so resurrection gets established. A mere storytelling, but that becomes the foundation of a very large theory or, is, or the foundation of a big religion. So he ascended to heaven and people started believing in him. 
Now, before he went to heaven, there is also a belief that he established a church. Now, if he established the church, there must be some divinity in that church. But we don't find anything. As soon as the Roman Empire accepted Christianity as its official religion, they started persecuting. They persecuted Gentiles, they persecuted the Jews for 2,000 years. There were crusades with Muslims in which so many Muslims got killed. There were inquisition courts where you know people who, who were not accepting even the foolishness of the Catholic Church were done away with. They were thrown into burning oil. They were thrown into the dens of hungry lions. Or they were persecuted in Terpedo where limbs were separated. Even you know, older women were termed as witches and burned. All cruelties. We find the history of church, a history of cruelty, history of, let's say, all sorts of evil acts. Now, the ecclesiastical authorities, they lived a licentious, pleasurable life at the expense of the poor people. Church was the highest, I mean, let's say, feudal landowner in Europe. And they got most of the produce of the land. And that is one of the reasons why there was French Revolution. And even today's Pope says that 5% of all Popes are, are pedophiles. Imagine the number of the millions of children who lost their I mean, normal life because of these priests. Many of the priests and pontiffs and uh, higher ecclesiastical authorities of that time were licentious, womanizers. Many popes had their own keeps. Some of the popes made their illegitimate child the next pope. Some others, like Julius II, had, I mean, a sexual relationship with his illegitimate daughter. And you know, sometime the Vatican Palace was a den of harlots and there were orgies. So this is, I mean, one story of the entire church which is supposed to have been established by this Yeshua. And in another I mean, side of the story, ever since it got established, it fragmented. You find the Pontiac or the Pope of Rome excommunicating the Patriarch of Antioch and Antioch Patriarch in return excommunicating Pope. It goes on like that. And later on, you know, Luther, I mean, burns the papal bull which said, you know, which was to collect money for the construction of St. Peter's Basilica by selling indulgences. So Lutheran church forms. We find Calvin again disagreeing with the Pope and a number of edicts, Calvinism. We find in the England, I mean, the king totally seeds with the Pope and the England or the Church of England gets formed. We find Protestants, Catholics, I mean, there are hundreds of warring denominations now fighting each other. You remember the Protestant Catholic wars. Remember all the other, I mean, wars, sectarian wars that have taken place. So, the history of the church, we do not find any divine hands behind that. It fragmented, it has made evils, it has made all sins possible. So, where is divine hands guiding it at all? And today, most of the people who are believing or who were believers, they are deserting Catholicism and Christianity. And then you may ask, what about the God? It is funny to talk about the Jewish God, who is now the almighty God of Christians. Yahweh was actually a Middle Eastern war and mountain God, a mountain deity who migrated to the cluster of EI gods of Palestine and some way or other he got into the charge of, I mean, the Jews. And he ruled them with a lot of, let's say, selfishness. And this God, his prophets, you know, drunken prophets most of the time, they made him powerful, they made him almighty, they made him the god of all the universe, and he slowly becomes evolved into an almighty. Now, if we look into the Old Testament, we will find that this god is always angry, revengeful, envious, a monster. If he didn't like somebody or if somebody did not follow what he did, what he said exactly, he murdered them. Either he directly murdered or some, he sent somebody else, he murdered. He used to send, you know, fire, rain. He, otherwise, he would send big floods to destroy the entire human race. What more, I mean, demonish act do you want? He's not loving. In no way is he loving. 
the entire humans ever since they were created were in pain poverty pestilences pain diseases hundreds of diseases i mean are following them today even today or yesterday or i mean hundreds of years or thousands of years back they all died now there are i mean let's say very dangerous viruses like corona remember the european plague which killed half of europe there are so many other viruses aids the pine i mean uh, the, there are so many other let's say very dangerous viruses which have attacked and killed humans we do not find any god coming to the help even now most of the humans are in misery abject poverty even when we talk now children are dying without food without water to drink which god is helping them there is a lot of wealth you know let's say accumulated in the vaults of vatican millions of tons of gold they do not part with them church is the biggest corporation in the world earning money you know their product is god which production cost is zero and they have got a lot of revenue and the entire revenue is a profit every catholic i mean has to pay to the church from the time he is born to the time he dies and many of them have told me it is actually really feeling very bad to be in this organization because money is all that matters so we find that even the god's church is after money god is not helping the poor there has been you know floods earthquakes volcanic eruptions every sort of pestilence famines you name it natural calamities have been there which i mean obliterated human races i mean part of human race wherever it came smallpox virus smallpox disease for example where did god come with any help so we find absolutely no help no interference from god at all so why should we believe in such a creature who does not help human beings at all you know the catechism of the catholic church says that we need to we are created to know him to obey his commandments and to get on with this heaven and live with him forever but how many can know him how many can keep his commandments half of all the children born have died half of all people who are born have died as children they could not use their free will there are the mad the psychotic the feeble minded they cannot know god or his commandments so how do they do good and attain heaven if god is giving all of these categories heaven why not he give all of them all people humans i mean heaven and there is no need for a religion here but he doesn't seem to do that he gives them i mean pain suffering some of the children i mean some of the people born are born with criminal mind some are born with i mean let's say philanthropic helping mind some children are born in as i mean as offspring of criminals some others are born as children of good people these two groups cannot be expected to do right and wrong in the same way god is just leaving them to chance whatever happens happens so why should we believe in such a guy in the old testament or in the bible nobody can believe in that god is a monster a demon who has killed even i mean enemy soldiers by you know rolling stones from heaven as soldiers used to park he will roll the stone one by one and kill them or he will send fire rain this sort of a god who wants to believe and if he say that this god is i mean not at all interfering like in nirguna brahma of of hinduism i have no problem to accept i mean that seems to be more reasonable otherwise as the science today says the entire energy in the world is same there's no need for a creator it has been there it will be there is not going anywhere so if somebody says the god is cosmos as hindus believe i have no problem to accept but not the catholic god not a separate loving god who is interested in humans that is nonsense and that and all the things which i just now told you make me not believe in christianity at all thank you